Hey everybody, hope you're doing well here today on this Friday. It's Freestyle Friday again today, so we're going to have some real fun today talking about teamwork, really looking forward to it. We've got some great clips to play for you here today, but uh, first, before we get going, let's, uh, let's roll the countdown and get everybody all in here. Welcome to Real Ag Live, everybody. I'm your host, Sean Haney. Thanks a lot for joining us here today. Hope you're having yourself a great Friday. Winter has hit the prairies again. It is very cold, like plus five, six here in Lethbridge, Alberta here today. I heard, uh, talking to Andrew Campbell from Strathroy earlier today, that uh, they're expecting like 26 degrees Celsius on the weekend in Ontario. What? How can we have such a difference? That Canadian shield is apparently a bit of a shield when it comes to weather hope you're having yourself a great day as i said I, i'm hopefully you got some questions and comments today to help me through this next half hour because i'm gonna let you know i had the uh the vaccine yesterday the astrazeneca vaccine and i was like oh i got no effects i'm fine everything's good what are you guys talking about and as the day has progressed here i feel more and more incredibly like i've been on a massive bender last night so uh, we'll get through today's show important topic it is going to be all about teamwork and i'm really looking forward to that. It's such an important topic when it comes to the farm and how we manage that teamwork we build that teamwork is really really critical from the standpoint of it definitely impacts what our performance is and the harsh reality is is that teamwork does not just sort of happen we have to we have to work on it we have to massage it we have to develop it and, and probably sports is one of the, the greatest examples, right? Is where we talk a lot about how, you know, the team's not doing well. What's the locker room like? Are they getting along? Is there, are there battles behind the scenes? Are there, are there things that we don't know about as fans that are preventing the, the team from performing at that highest level? Well, the same goes on the farm. So let's, uh, and we got a few people shutting out here. Yeah, Winbin watching on YouTube says, uh, teamwork is everything in Australia. Uh, good to hear from you. Kara says it was 19 here on Tuesday. Yes, that's a, that's the weird part. We went from 19 Celsius to like four, like just like that, the drop of a hat. And if it's going to be this bloody cold on the prairies, can we at least get some moisture from it? Can I put that request in? Let's, uh, okay. I was talking about teamwork. You guys distracted me. I was talking about teamwork and uh, comparing it to sports. I want to play for you as a clip here from a number of years ago, Lanny McDonald. 
Calgary Flame great, as well as uh, Toronto Maple Leaf. He spoke, I believe this is from Crop Connect in Manitoba, and he spoke to the farmers that were in attendance there all about uh, the importance of the locker room, the team getting along, and how that really can lead to something like a championship. Of course, Lanny was a, a, a key part, maybe a bit of an aging role, but he played a key part in the Flames winning their one and only Stanley Cup. Bit of a, a bit of a dry spell since, and uh, we need more Lanny McDonald's maybe in places like the Flames dressing room. Let's play our first clip. When you get everyone on the same page, it's pretty easy. And you look at sports teams that struggle, uh, they're playing as individuals or guys are going off and doing their own thing versus uh, understanding and playing within that whole team concept. And here in Brandon today, the, the day after a big trade with the Winnipeg Jets, we had an example of that with uh, within the team in, in Winnipeg, it appears. Well, you certainly did, and, and I'm very happy for Winnipeg. I'm a Canadian hockey fan through and through. So I'd love to see uh, Calgary, uh, Vancouver, and Winnipeg all find a way to make the playoffs. I'm not sure if that's possible, but Winnipeg uh, did an unbelievable job in, in uh, helping themselves uh, try and find a way to make the playoffs. Uh, I love the trade. I think Tyler Myers could be a stud for years to come. Uh, Drew uh, Stafford is a better hockey player than people realize. And when you get into a good team uh, feeling and good team atmosphere, uh, guys like that uh, will find a way to stay around, and hopefully that's the case for Winnipeg. And that same thing, whether it's the NHL or, or a farm business with employees, that, uh, that applies everywhere in business? Well, it, it does, and you talk about farming, there's no better example of uh, hard work and determination. But uh, like here, sharing of thoughts and ideas at the conference, uh, doing the breakout sessions, and I love their idea of the, uh, the green team, the blue team, and the red team. I'd want to be on the red team. Um, <laughs> but uh, the fact that they're, they're all in different uh, conferences and they come together at different times and, and share those thoughts and ideas, but the breakout sessions are wonderful as long as people are talking and asking questions and then they feel good. Mm -hmm. have to ask you, uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, what do you think, uh, what do you think is the problem? Uh, well, leadership? I think it comes down to a lot of leadership. Uh, obviously they have uh, some great individual players that, that are playing their own game uh, versus uh, playing an overall great team concept. They probably have more talent than a team like Winnipeg or a team like uh, Calgary. But those other teams are playing together as a team, not caring who gets the credit, not caring who scores the goals or assists. Uh, they just care about uh, the end result. And uh, uh, you, you look at the conference today, uh, that's what it's all about, uh, the end result, uh, finding a way to work together and come out the other end feeling good. Of course, that was Lanny McDonald, Flames and Leafs legend from several years ago, uh, talking about, hey, what's wrong with the Leafs? Kelvin, the Leafs fan, got to get that in there in terms of what is going on with my Leafs. And uh, guess what? People are still asking that. It's like nothing has changed. It's like a moment in time. Who knew that that question would uh, kind of live for a long time? Although Calgary uh, not looking so hot e either. You know, interesting stuff what, um, what Lanny said there because it really applies, I think, to any sort of business as well as the locker room in sports is, you know, are certain players playing their their own game? Are they Are they kind of off the page with everybody else? And we've all been inside of a team or had people working for us in our team where, you know, they just, they just aren't, there's not like a synergy. They're, they're kind of got their own agenda, so to speak. They have their own program and, and they're having a hard time meshing and, and being a kind of a part of that cohesive unit. I, I think that applies in sports as, as well in, in a farm business or any sort of business for, for that matter. And one of the other things that Lenny talked about there was, you know, people worrying about who gets the credit. And there should always be enough credit to, to go around when things go really well. You know, teams, I, I think if you read any sort of a team expert, they probably tell you that, uh, you know, we sort of, uh, we lose together, we, we win together kind of a thing. And in sports, a little bit more of a blame game as coaches are, uh, 
cycled through uh, rather aggressively, depending on the sport. It can be uh, rather short-sighted when it comes to that, not as much in a, in a business setting. But, uh, you know, th- I think that really, really is a, is a bit of a factor at times when teams sort of like, they worry less about that, cr- from that, that credit aspect and they focus more on what is actually the end goal. And if we get there, if we achieve that, if we, if we make it across that line and have that success, we're going to celebrate together too. And that's kind of where, you know, seeding parties or planting parties or harvest parties, that's where that kind of mindset sort of com- comes from is, is the sense that, hey, boy, harvest was a push. It it was like we had to go hard. Boy, everybody put in way more time than they thought they would. There was a lot of adversity or we had we had really good conditions and we we pushed harder than we ever have and uh, we got done. And uh, and people celebrate together and and sort of do a bit of a cheers whether it's coffee or beer or whatever it is and say uh, congratulations to to everybody. Now, that all sounds great, but it has to be worked on. It just doesn't come naturally at, at all. Let's uh, got a comment here from Lara watching on Facebook. A crucial point from that clip is being able to ask questions, but also feel comfortable asking questions and communicating hard topics. Also, uh, I think a very, very good point from Lara there, absolutely, is uh, having that, you know, it, it's one thing to say, hey, uh, no dumb questions, right? Uh, it's one thing to say, uh, we want everybody to know, please ask. And then when people do, they're maybe treated uh, poorly by by the rest of the team. This can happen uh, all the time on the farm is where you know, people may have been on the crew for a number of years and the new person is trying to fit in, trying to find their place, trying to you know sort of find their place in the mix are, are treated as a bit of an outsider from, uh, from a knowledge standpoint. And once, once those new people start, stop asking questions, then it's it's kind of a on a path you you sort of set the stage for that person to be on a path to to nowhere so thanks for the comment lara uh and i as i was saying i think you know the working on it part is really really critical and when i when i thought of this topic yesterday i right away thought of this clip um and this discussion with tom greaves of patura seeds and there's a lot of situations on the farm that create conflict. And we're going to get to conflict in a second. But I want to play this clip with Tom first. And what makes Tom's situation unique is that, you know, Tom is now op- working in a family business that, you know, essentially he, he married into. He married his wife, Sheena, and they had a farming operation. And Tom has become a key part of the management team. Think about, you know, th- that could create an interesting dynamic when you're working uh, day every day with your in-laws. Not never mind just your in-laws are coming over for supper on Sunday. You're working day every single day side by side with your in-laws. There presents a, a lot of different challenges, personalities, and uh, a, a lot of potentials for conflict inside of a family business. And and Tom and uh, the Patura family have have done a great job of making it work. And so I want to play this clip with you. He was uh, he was in a, he appeared here on Real Ag Live going back a couple months ago uh, with Kara Oosterhaus. So let's, uh, let's play that clip right now. Here's Tom Greaves. So talk a bit about that dynamic. As you kind of mentioned, you, you came to farm or you came to the state seed business through your father-in-law. You know, we all, we talk about family dynamics, succession planning, all that stuff when it comes to dealing with your own parents. What was it like coming into kind of an operation that was with your in-laws? Um, yeah, for sure. You know, it's, uh, it was a process, I'll we'll, we'll say it. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what it was. Um, you know, so we actually have, uh, two business units here. We have Patera Seed Service, which is our retail, uh, business here, uh, and, uh, processing. So we do, uh, we do, you know, retail sales out to farmers. Uh, we do contract, uh, growing and production and sales, uh, and agronomy services here through that business. We also have uh, Petura Seed Farms, which is actually our, our farming operation. Uh, so we have uh, 4,000 acres of uh, uh, pedigreed seed production. Uh, we're select seed growers. Um, and between the two businesses, um, my brother-in-law actually uh, is the president of Petura Seed Farms, and I am the president of Petura Seed Service. So that was part of the uh, succession planning when we both came back into the business um we both have a 50 50 ownership into each business um but we both 
have uh, have our piece that we we run in our and we organize. Um, so you know, thinking looking back, you know, uh, when Cal came, to, Calvin Patura is my is my father in law. I married his daughter Sheena, uh, and uh, some people in the ag industry might also know of my wife Sheena Patura because she worked for Cantera Seeds uh, as their director of marketing for quite a while. Um, but when I got uh, when he asked me to join, you know, we were we went through the whole gamut. We actually got a uh, a business coach involved uh, to help us because uh, you know you know when you talk to a lot of people, they say you're going to get involved with the family business. Ew, are you <laughs> sure? That's probably a mistake. I, I got a lot of that, um, and I will say you know to my in-laws' uh, credit, um, they they did a great job of laying out the process of uh, using the business coach, walking through it. And they were very pragmatic of, of understanding and, and let's talk about all the issues that could arise. So you know, we talked about uh, everything from what if it doesn't work? Um, what is the out plan? Um, you know, how, you know, hopefully it's, you know, how does it work and how can we make it work? But, and how do we set up that structure? But we talked through, uh, you know, the whole process and made sure that, everyone really understood you know what they were getting into what everyone's roles responsibilities were so that we could hopefully set up for success that was tom greaves a seed grower from manitoba tom made some really really interesting points there one right away that sticks out to me that i think a lot of farms don't really engage in is the coaching aspect of it right they a lot of farms sort of Ah, it's got to work out. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Like, it, it's going to work out, right? We're optimistic people. I think in agriculture, you have to be optimistic and, and think that everything's going to be work out fine. Every year, year is a, a new year, so to speak. And we, we kind of run our businesses that way sometimes too. And in this case, the Paturas, you know, made, you know, took the initiative to, to seek out a business coach to help them through the process. And, and sort of like, a, sort of almost like a, in Tom's case, a, almost like a prenuptial when it comes to a marriage, they did that on the business. And, and that's, a, you know, that's something that a lot of people don't actually do. What happens if this doesn't work out? How are we going to unwind this business transaction that we have engaged in? But I, I think some of that coaching can still work in the setting of inside of a team inside of a farm. You know, uh, we just recently posted a Mind Your Farm business talking about professional development. And I think this is, you know, this is where this kind of fits is uh, not just your own professional development. What are the skills that you want to work on and strengths you want to build on? But that can also be looked at what's the professional development plan for your team as well. And this can be hard on the farm because some of us have businesses where the team members are fresh every year. It's a new set of people. So that's a whole nother challenge. You know, how do you, how do you recreate the environment every single year with a new crop of, of team members? Some of you are also dealing with the fact that you you have the same people every year. Now that can also bring challenges too, because you know you, you got to sort of people can lower their drop their guard, so to speak, on developing the team because they're kind of used to each other. So this is all stuff that uh, is is really really uh, critical. And uh, I want to give a shout out. Hey Franklin, watching on YouTube, appreciate you you turn, uh, tuning in. Uh, Tom talked about the, the transparency and setting expectations when it comes to team members. Also, I think uh, a critical, critical point that sometimes can, can probably be sort of overlooked on any sort of a team. And, uh, we all know, like, you know, go back to the sports example. We all know of like, we, we know that what a great team should look like, how it should function, but you know, that's, that's like A to, you know, A to Z, but there's a whole bunch of letters in between that uh, that really, really are the challenging part of this, trying to bring everybody together and have that team operating at at full capacity. Because let's be honest, in, in today's work environment, just do it uh, because I said so probably uh, sometimes isn't the best when it comes to building that sense of team that uh, people are people want to work for or people are striving to, to, to participate in. So... Um, now, a component of teamwork inside of a business, and especially when it involves family, is conflict. And an interview that I think of from this past year that I think is one of the, the best ones that I have participated in where I just, I loved the conversation. It just, it brought up a lot of personal experiences. It, it also made me think of these are some of the challenges that a lot of you are going through, especially at high stress times, like what we're about to enter here, 
with seeding and planting time. And as people get tired and emotions start to run a little bit high, stress is there, right? You want to get the crop in as, as best we can. And, you know, I think uh, harvest time is another one of these moments in time. Conflict can arise. And our next clip is going to talk about the fact that not all conflict is bad. Teams need conflict. There is a great book uh, by Patrick Lincioni, and it's called Death by Meeting. And it's, it's a very small, it's a very short book, but it's incredibly impactful. And he talks about in order to have a good meeting, you have to have some conflict. If everybody always agrees about everything, really, are, are you hashing out what some of the best ideas are, the best decisions are, and, and those kinds of things. So recommend that book, Death by Meeting. It's fantastic. Uh, but our next clip is, is with Kelly Dobson of Leadership at, a, at a Winnipeg. And he talks about the mushy middle and how you how you spur good conflict, why people avoid conflict. And we all know in family businesses, there's a lot of conflict avoidance uh, because we're trying to avoid the big blow up where uh, the, the, you have the overlap of generations, you have the overlap of family emotions, that crossing of swords of family in the business. And it can be uh, a really uncomfortable disastrous situation if not handled properly. So let's uh, let's listen to our next ki- clip from Kelly Dobson. I'd be interested in what any of you have to say in in terms of uh, what you hear here, okay? And, and I agree with Jim. Jim Hale says, if everyone agrees, why have the meeting? Why are we here? What is the point to this? And uh, as, that's where the respect and the trust, I think, really, really comes in. And uh, people, and, and people sort of uh, being careful or I guess cognizant of how they're bringing their points across uh, that really leads to that constructive sort of discussion when it comes to whether that's that tailgate in terms of, hey, what are we doing today? Versus uh, maybe something that's a little bit more official in, in, a, in a boardroom from a planning perspective. So let's go to our next clip, Kelly Dobson of Leadership. Uh, this is some audio, it's not video, but it is incredibly impactful. I really recommend you listening to this full uh, this full interview from Mind Your Farm Business from this season. So here's Kelly Dobson. You know, that's an interesting subject. I think the word conflict is probably the stuff we hear about, which is the people who are openly arguing. Um, I would say it's this way. I would say from what I've experienced and even how we measure it, the actual bigger the bigger um, concern for me is that there isn't sufficient um, sufficient discussion about the things that matter most. And so what we see oftentimes when we're working with leaders, we'll see people who will measure very high in something called passivity. And believe it or not, so like things that we would we would talk about as being conflict, so people who are arrogant, rude, um, autocratic, controlling, um, highly critical, those are all strongly negative correlated um, behaviors to to leader effectiveness. But actually, want but actually the one behavior passivity, it's it's a full 10, 10 points more negative than those. And I and I and that's what the research says. And I'll say when my experience on the farms, I am more concerned about the farms who are holding issues that they simply won't speak about because they are so concerned about everybody getting along and that there be no conflict and that and and they just uh, they have no appetite for it. And I, I think there's, a, you know, more as much or more risk in that than the notion that we ever hear about the big time conflict that goes on in farms. Those are the ones we hear yeah. about, right? That's interesting that. Okay, so there is conflict on the farm because it's a family business. Families families sure. like to, to battle about certain things, especially it applies to generational differences or the you know, the direction the farm's going and stuff like that. But me, you know, I, I never really thought about, okay, so it's not about the level of conflict, but the question is, when we have conflict, is it about the right things? Like, are, are we, are we, you know, we think we're sort of figuring stuff out and we're having conflict trying to come to the right conclusion, but we're not even talking about the right issue. That That's like a double-edged sword. Yeah, so that's a lot to unpack. So, you know, I'll do my best to try and unpack that as the way that we try and explain it. Because so much of what we do or what I try to do through, through leadership is helping people put this in a box in a way that they can understand so that they can actually see it when it's happening and then go, this is not going the direction we want. And how can I show up in that conversation, whether I'm the boss or not, how can I show up in a way that's going to drive, drive this forward? So for example, one, so 
so to move this out of a conflict stance and move this into a leadership stance, the first thing I want to say is that um, we should always be driving towards and, and strengthening partnership. In partnership, like, like I said in this last, was this idea where everybody feels responsible for whatever we are, for whatever we're doing together. Now, the way we get to partnership is that we start with something called interpersonal clarity. And this is foundational. So interpersonal clarity, simply put, is you understand what I, where I'm coming from. I understand where you're coming from. And we know the differences between the two of them. Now, that doesn't happen at like a bolt of lightning in one conversation, particularly the more challenging the conversations like farm transition. You can take several types of these engagements where we begin to understand each other. And what we know what the research says is that for most for most um, situations or on, on what we, if you want to call them conflict on the farm, if we can get to a to to a conversation where we get to, to interpersonal clarity, four out of five of those problems solve themselves without any kind of like directive, problem solving, any kind of mediate, like dare I say the word mediation, because people just figure out what's going on. And dare I say that the biggest problem, the biggest source of, of, of conflict in the farm is that people are really suffering from a real insufficient level of partnership. And the consequences can be conflict, it can be low productivity, it can just be mistakes, you name it. And what we know, what this is really all about, so if it's not interpersonal clarity, you said, so what's really going on? If you want to put it, you want to put it all into one big deal, there's this thing we call interpersonal mush. And interpersonal mush is this, is when I go around and I make stories up about the world around me and what your intentions are, and then I act on them as if they're actual fact. Oh, yes. And I don't check them out. Now, that sounds super simple, but when we pa unpackage how we create our experience, and there's like the objective observable world, like what I heard and what I saw, and then there's all the stories that I make up about what's happening and, and so on and so forth. We click them together and that creates our experience. But, but if we're not very self-aware and we're under a lot of stress and the world is moving fast, we don't, we just, we don't know what, it, what's part I made up and what part is real. Who has not been on a team where that has not happened? Where somebody says something, you're like, who the hell told you that? Where, where did you get that idea? I never said that. I never thought that. That was never my intent. What? We've all been there. We have, we have, I, if, if you say you have not been there with what Kelly calls interpersonal mush with yourself or somebody else on a team, I, I think you're maybe not being a little bit, uh, you're not being introspective uh, enough. A lot of good stuff there in that clip. Uh, Kara says, what really stands out to me is interpersonal clarity. If we only did have that lightning bolt moment, Dobson is referring to getting to that point of interpersonal clarity can be a very, very difficult task. Extremely difficult, Kara, because a lot of it, I think, like Kelly talks about in that interview, is, is the trust factor. People taking the time, making the effort to, to understand where everybody is coming from. This is extremely difficult when we're talking about generations. Never mind when we're talking uh, relationships with people we work with on the farm, people that are employees, uh, when we talk about the generations inside of a family, we've all been in these, uh, we can all role play on both sides of the equation where we have really messed this up. And like he says, there's like, as you identified, Kara, there's no lightning bolts. There's no silver bullets. These things just don't happen. And everybody, I would imagine, has been through this situation where, there's something bothering us. There's a point of conflict that should be addressed, but we go through this decision-making process, at least I know I have, where you hold back and you don't want to bring it up because you're worried that the reaction and the consequences of what you've brought up are actually worse than the pain and agony of what you're dealing with on a daily basis <laughs> that you're experiencing with, with that person in, in, in the relationship, right? And so that interpersonal mush, mush like he talks about, it, it, it can really, really happen and spin out of control uh, if, we, if it's not addressed. He talks about in terms of interpersonal clarity, that strengthening of partnership uh, where everybody understands where everybody is coming from, especially it applies to the generations of the farm, which I, I, I think is the key part of building that team. If, if the generations involved in the farm aren't on the same page, don't have that interpersonal clarity, how the hell do you expect the people that are working for you, the, the, the people that are on your team, how do you expect them to have any sense of teamwork and any sense of clue what the really 
any sort of uh, what, what the goals really, really are. So I, 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 I recommend it, that that episode with Kelly Dobson on the Mind Your Farm business is all about conflict, and I could, I just, I have, I've actually sent it to people I know that run small businesses, that maybe work with a, a family member, uh, whether that's their dad, their mom, brother, sister. I've sent it to them. That they're even in agriculture and it applies. So if you, if you, if you're in any sort of a business, that episode on conflict management with Kelly Dobson from a leadership perspective, he's with Leadership is his company, but it, we, he looks at conflict from through the lens of leadership. It is just so powerful, and it, it, it really I think light bulbs like ding 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 ding, ding like the fireworks will be going off in your own head as you as you think about things that you do or people on your team are doing. And I think that's a, a key part in, as Kara pointed out, that interpersonal clarity is so critical. A part of it is not just thinking outward, but is probably also looking inward. What role did I play in in creating this sort of interpersonal mush, as Kelly describes? Uh, Kara watching on Facebook says, often you hear romantic relationships that if you don't have trust, you don't have anything. It's amazing that we don't often think of this when it comes to business relationships too. This should be in all relationships in in life my, my daughter always does this thing where she calls it the trust fall like you're you're in the kitchen doing like you know maybe having a sandwich or opening the fridge or making a cup of coffee and she will just do this like hey trust fall and she'll just like fall backward it, it annoys the crap out of me it is absolutely hilarious um, but it's kind of maybe trying to prove some of that point is that you have to have trust in in any sort of relationship so Really, really fun stuff. I appreciate everybody uh, joining us here today. This, this is a critical topic as we hit this. Uh, this you know, winter can be a little bit slower on the foot. This is when the money is made, especially when we look at the markets. <laughs> we we want to try to get this crop in as as perfect as we possibly can with all the people that are around us, family members, team members, employees, staff. And teamwork really comes to, into play at this moment. Hopefully, when it comes to your teamwork on your farm, these are things that we work on throughout not only the summer, but also the winter season for those people that are around us year-round. Because you just, like Kelly said, it's just not the flick of a switch. It's just not like, oh, hey, we're a great team. By the way, everybody, we're a great team because I said so. That is not how this works. It requires effort, time, and commitment by everybody. So hopefully uh, you enjoyed today's show on teamwork. If you have any thoughts on what you think makes a great team, if you have examples of what you think is a great team, whether that's in business or in sports, I always love talking about sports. We could talk about college football from a teamwork perspective, but I would bore the crap out of most of you. So we'll leave it at that. But uh, I would love to hear some of your examples that kind of inspire you and that you take examples from because examples really sort of set the stage for us for for sure so thanks everybody for getting real and getting connected with real ag live i hope you enjoyed today's show don't forget to tune in to real ag radio today 4 30 eastern on rural radio 147 we got a great panel we've also got the minister of agriculture she will join us and then myself and andrew campbell and kelvin hepner will break in break down some of the things that she said as well as some other items as well as the port of montreal looks to maybe have a general strike on monday that is going to be the story of next week i promise you that. Have a great weekend, everybody. Cheers.